Hello and welcome to this week's GG Weekend Watch, kindly sponsored by SBK, with myself taking over in the hosting seat from Leona Mayer, who is probably currently galloping her adventure around a field as we speak, which is a very fair excuse for her not being here, and we wish her all of the luck for this weekend. So instead, you have me, Kate Tracy, to guide you through Saturday's best bets from Goodwood, Beverly and Newmarket and anywhere else our expert pundits wish to take us to and you'll be delighted to hear that those expert pundits are GG Weekend Watch regulars Daryl Carter and Andrew Mount who have been in flying form these past few weeks certainly more so than myself at York at least anyway we had four winners on the show last week including a hat trick of wins for Daryl so very well done to you both. And hopefully we can continue that into this weekend as well. In terms of the forecast, we currently have no rain forecast for Goodwood with warm and sunny conditions predicted. The same at Beverly, no rain in the forecast, warm and sunny conditions predicted. And you guessed it, full house at Newmarket, no rain in the forecast, warm and sunny conditions predicted. What a difference a week makes from this time last week at York, where every man and his dog was trying to predict what the weather was going to do at York. So this is a, a welcome surprise this weekend. And hopefully, therefore, provided there isn't an excessive amount of watering at each of our tracks, we should get proper, fair, summer racing conditions across the board but if there are any changes you can find any changes to selections on the website at gg.co.uk or on any of our social media channels hopefully that won't be necessary and confidence will remain behind all selections we're about to discuss with the guys here so without further ado we have better crack on with some racing and I thought we'd best do this in chronological order, meeting by meeting, because it doesn't take much to confuse me and I don't want to get lost and forget any races. So we will begin with the 150 at Goodwood. This is the Prestige Stakes, a group three for two-year-olds over seven furlongs. And this looks a wide open contest, plenty of unknowns evidently. The two most experienced runners in this race, just four runs apiece. So is this just a case of who has the most potential to take forwards in the race? Would you rather be a potential or would you rather be with no form in with one of the more experienced runners, Andrew? Um, yeah, I think I'd rather skip this and move on to the next race. A <laughs> bit, uh, what a, a little, start. <laughs> a little bit of a tricky one. Yeah, well, uh, welcome, Kate, by the way. Thanks Thank for uh, ju jumping into the hot seat. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, seven to two the field with the prices I'm looking at at the moment. And uh, that seven to two is uh, uh, Danar or uh, if you're uh, um, uh, up north, Danner. Danner. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, probably given too much to do by James Doyle at uh, Deauville last time, if you want to be hypercritical after that uh, impressive debut success. And just one of several with, with a good chance. Hello You was only sixth at York last week, um, but that was the stable debut for David Lockman, and he, he does really well with horses. He takes over from other yards at the second time of asking, so I'm expecting more from Hello uh, Hello You this time. Wilderness Girl looks very progressive, having won over a course and distance in that um, uh, the glorious meeting. But the one I'm just going to take a, a stab at and a big prize, Prosperous Voyage, who uh, had a really tough trip uh, at, um, at Chester last time out drawn wide, coming from off the pace. We, we know how difficult that is. And at the prices, uh, I think she's around about 14 to 1. So uh, I'll, I'll just go very tentative each way on Prosperous Voyage. But it wasn't a race that I wanted to get too involved in. Hopefully, Daryl's got something uh, more concrete than I have. Is that true, Daryl? Do, do you feel <laughs> you have more of a confident stab at, at a race with so many unknowns? Um, well, I, I, I did during the week. I backed Dania at five to two, thinking that was a great bit of value, and uh, she's now seven to two. So uh, that didn't quite work out for me. <laughs> I thought Dania was probably the one to be on. Actually, I was quite impressed with her run at Kempton. Um, the final three furlong time figure was pretty useful, considering she finished out the last half a furlong under hands and heels. Over at Dovil last time, it all just went wrong. She blew the start. Mm. She was far too keen on the inside of the track, uh, on the inside rail with on the worst of the ground. She was waiting and waiting for room off a slow, very, very slow dictated pace. Um, and by the time the gaps came, the, the race was over. I thought she and the second uh, horse, uh, Zelly, 
for Andre Farber, the two to take out of the race. Uh, Zeddy was a, a thrice winner before that race. Uh, and she looks a nice prospect. I think Daniel's got a pretty, a pretty nice turn of foot, a little bit more to come. I think the return to a sound, or, or the first time on a sounder surface, we'll definitely see her improve. Uh, and I thought she was the right market leader. I, I'm slightly concerned she's drifted out to seven to two. Mm. Um, but uh, yeah, I thought she was one to be on. Hello, you's interesting. She tanked through the louder at York last time. I'd be surprised if she could cope with the turn of foot of, of Daniel. And I'm not entirely convinced of this step up in, to seven furlongs, given the way she keeps flattening out over the uh, over the six. I'm not entirely sure that's that's the right move by David Lockdown, but uh, she's an interesting runner. Cliff, uh, is it Cliff Arrow for David Simcock? This is a horse we should mention because this horse got stacks of potential. It was a really eye-catching run on debut at Newbury behind Dubai Jewel, and she was getting six pounds that day. But uh, she she was pretty green. She travelled through the race really strongly, but it just took a minute for the penny to drop. Now, whether or not coming to Goodwood on her second start, she's going to have enough experience for an undulating track like this. I'm not entirely sure. But she's definitely one to keep on side going forward. She, she's got plenty of potential. But uh, I think think uh, Dania's turn of foot here is, is going to kill this race at a, a crucial moment. So, yeah, Dania. Yeah, I guess the biggest concern with Dania is if she blows the start again as last time out, which I found a bit of a concern from her debut where she did nothing wrong with the start to her second start if she falls victim to that again, but totally agree with you. She looks so smart on that debut. Uh, I have to give my own opinion in this race. Well, I, I feel like I haven't got too many better opportunities to, to have a selection in um, in any of these races. So I'm going to side with Wilderness Girl, who I think has been overlooked slightly here. She's just a typically improving juvenile from the Andrew Bolding Yard. She showed that on her second start after finishing and staying on fourth on her debut at Newmarket over seven, then winning at Glorious Goodwood on a net start. Did that in really good style over this course and distance. And again, she kept on well over the seven in the soft ground last time out. So I think she looks a filly with plenty to come. This track and trip clearly poses her no issues. So in a race full of unknowns, I thought she represented a bit of value in that contest. So we'll move on to the next race at Goodwood. This is the 225. This is a handicap for three-year-olds and over, again, over seven furlongs. Now, this race doesn't have a good record for three-year-olds in recent years. The last three-year-old winner came in 2014, and that's the only three-year-old winner in the last 10 years as well. Five- and six-year-olds generally favoured, but we don't have any five-year-olds in the race this year, at least. Um, doesn't seem to be a huge draw bias in recent years. Ideally, you want it to be rated around the 100 marker. Um, for all last year's winner, was rated 89. So the three-year-old trend will be against our current market leader in Aratus because, as I say, he is a three-year-old, but he is certainly running off of the right mark. But who do you think, or do you think, he can gain another win and bring up a four-timer here, Daryl? No. Um, <laughs> I, 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 t I tipped him at Newbury last time um, and, and he got the job done, but everything went right for him that day. Yeah, clear sailing, um, but nothing went right for the two in behind. I thought the pace of the race was steady early on. Uh, I thought he was well positioned, um, whereas I thought Sunset Bay came from a lot further back. And the third, who we know quite a lot about, uh, is Silver Samurai. Got no run at all that day. I had to switch wide on the track and stayed on really strongly, only beating two lengths. I think that was enough for me to suggest that he might be just reaching uh, his level for the moment. I know he's very unexposed and he's entitled to improve again, but uh, I just thought in a stronger race here, I thought he was one to, to oppose. Mm -hmm. I, I like two in this race. Um, I'm going to I'll back two in this race because just because of the prices, the, the favourites taking up a good chunk of this market. I thought Escobar was the first one that was, was on my list for David O'Mara. He's running the Running really well at the moment. It um, was, was a good fifth at York last time, but plot at start, he, he was uh, shortened up for room at a crucial stage behind May Danny in the, in the Golden Mile. Prior to that, he'd run two days before in the Lennox. Again, didn't really get into full stride. He does like it here at Goodwood. He's not mm. for seven, but four of his runs have come in Group 2 or Group 3 company. I'm sure he's going to go in sooner or later. I think back on a sounder surface here at Goodwood, this is far weaker than, the last, than two of his last three runs at least. I'd even go as so far as to say it's, it's weaker than his York, um, York field last time. So I thought he was very interesting, off a one pound higher mark. Um, he, he's a group listed level performer, isn't he? Yeah. You know, and um, he's got every chance in, in this race. I think this is a weak race. The only other one I'd be concerned about is Al Ruffa for John and Thaley Gosden. This horse bolted up last year at Newmarket, looked at potential group material going forward. Now he's been off 336 days, but the hood's on, and Frankie Dettori's here. 
that might mm. be signalling that he's he's fit enough to do himself justice here. Slight question mark you would have is that he's got a Cambridgeshire entry. Uh, it could be a prep run for that going forward. Um, and he's drawn out wide in stall nine. But he's got that little bit of unknown um, about him. He could still yet be anything. Um, he was really impressive at Newmarket twice last year. And I can't rid that performance out of my head, to be honest. He's off a mark of 102. That's not going to be a, an issue at all. Just whether or not he's fit and ready to go today is a slight question mark. But uh, the prices, I think you can back him anyway and just take a chance. Couple the pair, Escobar and Al Ruffer, and I think you'll be there or thereabouts. Very good. And I, I really agree that Escobar, he's just lurking, isn't he? You just know that a win in a contest of this nature is is around the corner. It's just when it's going to be. Andrew, your opinions on this race, please. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to uh, counter your three-year-old stats. Because um, oh, no. I, I, I don't <laughs> think they're significant in terms of how many three-year-old runners have been. I mean, since mm. we had that 16-1 shot in 2014, the following year, there were 19 runners in this race. Only two of them were three-year-olds. Um, the year after that, there were no three-year-olds. Um, we had 2017, five of the six three-year-olds were poorly drawn in double figures when low draws dominated. 2018, 17 runners, only three three-year-olds. Um, two of them were placed, uh, including 16 to 1 from a bad draw. 2019, we had one three-year-old from 12 runners, 33 to 1. Last year, two of the eight were three-year-olds and it was COVID and they obviously hadn't had, to, you know, they had it was a bit <laughs> early in the season to be running against, you know, they hadn't had the opportunity to run against their own age group before sort of, um, you know, taking on the older horses. So uh, I, I'm very impressed by Aratus. He's lucky not to be unbeaten in his four starts. And um, I think there's plenty more to come from him. He's nicely drawn towards the inner. There's no obvious pace in this race, which makes it tricky for the likes of Escobar, I think, who loves to come late off a strong gallop. You've got maybe Persuasion, maybe Dance Fever, a stable mate of Aratus who, who could go forward, but none of them you know, t tend to do that anyway. So it's it's a bit of a horrible race in that respect. Um, that could count against, oh, this is us, a horse Daryl's napped successfully at a big price in the past. He's 10 from 30 in handicaps. Good profit if you're back in blind in these races. So even though he's got a, some, he's got 111 or something like that, I, I think he'll, uh, mm. um, you know, he could run a uh, run, run a good race um, despite the high mark. But I'll I'll go with the Rattus. Fours into five to two when the betting opened. Uh, sadly, I missed the fours, but um, I, I still think he's the likeliest winner uh, despite no three-year-old winner since 2014. I like yeah. your stat, Kate. <laughs> who am I? Who am I to doubt the stat man here? <laughs> With the three-year-olds. No, hopefully it will be changing fortunes, at least for the win purposes for the three-year-olds for Andrew anyway. But not so much because I have a selection in here as well at a uh, slightly bigger price. And it's on the pace angle that Andrew has just talked about as well. And it's Kimmy Five, who you can get about an each way price round. At the current time of recording, you can get 12 to 1 at and I thought he represented the value in this race because of that lack of pace. And I really hope that David Bridgewater can also see that and switch tact with this lad. Hopefully he can bounce out from stool one. If he doesn't, he's probably going to get stuck on the rail and his race will be over. So you'll really know his fate very quickly, I think, with this lad. But he really does come alive at Goodwood. He's back down to his last winning mark of 88 as well. That win coming over this course and distance. He does need a bit of revitalising, which may well come from a switch of yard. Um, his rating is an ideal for this race. Uh, he's about the right age, though, and has that all-important course and distance form to his name. Just please, David Bridgewater, please tell Nicola to bounce him out from school one and just, just completely do something different. That's what I'm really hoping for here. Now, the three o'clock race we'll move on to. This is a group three, the March stakes for three-year-olds over a mile six. Now, we only have a small runner affair for this race, which is the norm for this race, really. It makes sense because there aren't many three-year-olds who have really proven themselves in group company over this trip just yet. And the horse who is a very strong favourite at the head of the market is Nagano. But I do think that he's a horse that sets the standard in this race. is a rating of 101, showing that leaves him one pound ahead of Dancing King and Juan del Montalban. He was a winner last time out on his first visit to Goodwood. That coming in a mile four handicap. Subsequent £7 rise for that win has forced his hand into group company. But the way he shaped in the soft ground last time out, I thought suggested this extra two furlongs should really bring out further improvement in him. And I thought he can take advantage of this small runner field. But 
my opinion doesn't matter as much as your vote. So, Andrew, your opinions, please, on this race. Yeah, uh, tricky one. I mean, Nagano's um, bloodily obvious and priced accordingly, so not much juice in the price. But I was going to take a stab at um, Classic Lord, who's 11 to 2. I mean, Dancing King, I thought, might have been flattered making the running at um, Chester. Still couldn't win, got um, done by a horse who came from off the pace. He's probably going to put pace to this race as well. But Classic Lord ran at that very biased Sandown meeting on the 22nd of July, when practically every winner was well off the rail. And Leap came round the houses and uh, um, it was sort of sl- um, slightly disappointing on the... Well, so he so won, won that race. Um, several, several horses disappointed after racing towards the rail. Classic Lord actually ended up on that inside rail in the swamp still managed to win, uh, which was pretty impressive, even though he was wide early. Rosabad, uh, another rail runner in that race who finished last of four, uh, came out and bolted up at Carlisle next time from Mark Johnson. So I just thought um, it was a, you know, even though he was 11 or 10 favourite, he's only won narrowly. I thought he was probably on the slowest part of the track in the closing stages. You can probably upgrade it. Uh, Andrew Baldwin at Goodwood and uh, at 11 or 2 or thereabouts, a little bit of value against the even money shot. Definitely so. As you say, it is. It's a trappy enough contest, I thought. I did think that Nagano is a, a short enough price, but also the most likely winner. But, Daryl, how did you assess this race? Uh, well, I, I couldn't find an angle or a bet in here, to be honest with you. I, mm. I thought Nagano was the obvious choice. I thought coming back on a sounder surface would, would see him in a better light as well. I thought he was better than a fair result of Goodwood, having made up so much ground on the field um, in ground that he probably didn't like for the first time. A step up and trip look, looks to suit him well he's a, he's a bit of a lazy horse but uh, once he gets mm. going he really does get going and he motors he's got loads more to come I, I wouldn't want to take him on I, I agree with Andrew in terms of I think thought Classic Lord may be the one to give him most to think about um, mm. but apart from that I couldn't really get involved in the race to be honest yeah, it is. It's just one of those races, isn't it? It's, it? It is just sort of, you're trying to find any angle into it and it is hugely difficult. So instead, we'll move on to hopefully more of a betting heat in the feature race on Saturday. This is the 3.35, the Group 2 Celebration Mile, funnily enough, over a mile for three-year-olds and over. And I'm really excited about this race because we get to see Ben Battle making his reappearance start on the back of an 11-month absence. In my opinion, this looks a perfect race for him. He's the only Group 1 winner in the race. Those group, three Group 1 wins, all coming abroad, however, at Caulfield, Australia, at Munich and Maidan. But his mark of 118 does show that he is the best horse in this race. He is a seven-year-old now, but I still thought he can put his Group form to good use yet again. He's proven himself on the back of a break before when winning the Group 2 Joel Stakes on the back of an 11-month absence. So, Daryl, do we side with Group 1 winning form for a runner who, or or do we side with a runner who may well make it up into a Group 2 slash potential Group 1 performer? Well, I don't think there is any potentials in here to be a, mm. to be a group. I, I, every horse in this race, near enough, comes in here with some sort of negative to their name. Ben Battle at the top of the market, you know, it's 11 to 4. I think that's a fair price, given the fact that he's been off for nine months. Uh, he's got no course experience. He's drawn wide for front-running tactics. He's only two for five in the UK for the last three years. Um, he has got a good record fresh, though. Uh, sorry, Ben Soror has got an 18% strike rate, I think, off with horses off 300 days or more. He's a class act in the field. I think if you're mm. going to take a chance on any in this race, I think... At 11, you're talking about 11-4 to 4 for Ben Battle. You're not talking about a 6-4 to four shot. It could be a QE2 prep. You don't know. But the, the yeah. ground only turns up soft at, in October at Ascot. So I can't imagine they're going to leave too much on him. Um, Chindi, I'm not entirely sure about the undulating track. I didn't think when they went to Newmarket for, a thousand, for the 1,000 guineas, I didn't think he'd handle the track there, which it, it didn't look like he did. I don't think he's improved this season from 2 to 3. It's probably easy to say, well, look, he's bumped into poetic flair and... And Palace Beer on, on his last three starts, but don't worry about what's in front of him. If you look at the horses behind him, mm. he's not really beaten a lot. Muta Sabek last time. Um, Muta Sabek's a strange horse. He's, <laughs> visually, he gives you the impression that he, he's going to be some sort of superstar. But I mean, he looked good at Haydock last time, but the form is worth absolutely nothing. Mm. Um, the handicapper didn't even put up, put up the 84 rated second, Assad. And he went out next time was beaten off the same mark in a handicapper. So that, the handicapper knew what he was doing there. 5,000 to 1 in that race was out of sorts. And Baradar is a soft ground horse. He was returning from 235 days off the track. Um, but you can pick holes in nearly all of these. Perotto 
is interesting. He's improving with each run. I didn't think he was strong enough at the death at, at Salisbury last time for Harold McAllen. I just, I like him and he has not got many negatives, but I just get the feeling that he's not going to be good enough to beat a even half-cooked Ben Battle. Um, <laughs> Dukes of Hazard is is one of the interesting ones as well. He's probably going to hit the frame here. He's four figures of 1-1, one, one, uh, one, 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 on good ground. Um, his second came behind Space Blues in the Lennox two years ago. He's got the ground um, and he's got his track. He is one of the more interesting runners at a double figure price to hit the frame if you if you want it each way bet and you don't really want to take a chance on on Ben Battle. But uh, this is his third run in sixteen days. Happy Power shouldn't really be good enough to win this. He's got a grabby action. He looks like he wants soft ground seven furlongs. Pogo, you'd be disappointed if he starts winning this. And Stormy Antarctic, yeah. whether he's going to run or not with a ground drawing up all the time, is, is anyone's guess because he wants soft ground as well. This is by far below the calibre of horses that Ben Battle is used to running against. Um, now, I know he wasn't probably at his best when beaten by Kamiko in the Shadow Joe last year, but I thought he did too much too soon uh, with Frankie on him that day. I like Hoshin back on board. I could just see him pinging out, trying to make the run in and uh, not being caught, really. Uh, I think 11 to 4 is either going to look like an absolute God given gift or <laughs> it's going to go, or it's going to be. The market told you that he needed a prep run before the QE2. You know yeah. what I mean? But That's I think, it, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, but I think, I mean, you're not talking about a six to four shot, you're talking about 11 to four shot. I think you can roll the dice. And if you're going to take a chance on anybody in this field, I think it has to be Ben Battle. Yeah. Sorry, my, sorry, my chair keeps going down like that. <laughs> <laughs> That is the case, though, isn't it, with Ben Battle? It's, he he is this price probably because of those doubts over his fitness levels. But, I mean, Andrew, do you take the similar light that if he is tuned up, then he really should be taking all the beating in this race? Kate, I'm really disappointed with your segue. You, you could have said, talking of God-given gifts, what do you think, <laughs> what do you think Andrew? Dar- Daryl so, threw it up and I just yeah. missed. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I'm, I'm with Daryl. I'm, I'm a Dukes of Hazard fan. You know, I think I had my mm. first cross on uh, Daisy Duke and always used to love the TV show growing up. But, um, yeah, I'm, I'm going to... Um, I, I like Daryl's case about Ben Battle. Almost a bit like Mish Reef, really. P- people start get, getting into their head that this horse doesn't win in uh, in the UK. But you know, you, you go back to uh, the season before last. It was uh, September. Been off for several months. Came back and won, won easily at um, Newmarket. Kind of horse who sort of wins. And you think, yeah, that was obvious, wasn't it? Why didn't I back that at eleven or four? But I'll go to, um, Duke of Hazard each way. He goes well at this time of year. As Daryl says, he loves Goodwood. He was beaten miles in this race last year, but that was because of soft ground. He's had four runs on good or faster going at Goodwood, three wins, and that two length second to Space Blues. You know, he won the race two years ago, and um, you know, he, he ran pretty well at York um, you know, last week. Do you I think that it... trip just stretched him at, that, that, yeah, at York, no, that probably, extra furlong? It's still pretty good run. He was 28 to 1. Mm. And, I mean, I put him up as a bet two runs ago at Salisbury, which with hindsight is a mistake because you look at his form at Salisbury. I think he's had three goes there now, got beat every time, even at his favourite time of year, sort of August time. And uh, it's probably just a case of that track, for whatever reason, doesn't suit him. So coming back to his favourite venue, ground to so I'm, I'm hoping uh, Kate's weather forecast is um, correct because uh, you know, <laughs> if, if it isn't, then I'm going to sue. But uh, yeah, Duke, 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 Duke of Hazard each way. That's it, yeah. V- Lucy Verisami in my former life. As you can see, I'm trying to channel my inner weather girl, which could be completely <laughs> false advertising. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> but yeah, so that is the summary of the feature race on Saturday, the Celebration Mile. And that rounds off our Goodwood um, races that we were scheduled to talk about. But I'm going to open it up to the floor now for any other Goodwood bets that either of you have. So, Daryl, I'll start with you. Anything else from Goodwood that we haven't mentioned yet? <laughs> Uh, no, no, not for me. You set that. You set that up like it was going to be a big. I was going to reel off a good couple of horses. I, I even just gave got, you. No. I even gave you the hand. <laughs> that is absolutely fine. We'll, we'll save it for some of the other meetings. Andrew, yourself. Uh, yeah, I'm just going to uh, mention uh, the 410 and Lawn Ranger and uh, perhaps Sweet Reward in the same race as well. Now, uh, they both ran at that Bias Sandown meeting on the 22nd of July behind Anderleep. The f- uh, there was eight runners. The first four all came from off the pace uh, and raced wide. The last four to finish all, all raced on the inner and were up with the pace. Now, um, Sweet Reward did best of those and then ran second at Glorious Goodwood. Has bombed out since, but back to Goodwood could go well. And Lawn Ranger was uh, Lawn Ranger was six. Lawn Ranger's then gone to Windsor, three-runner race outside of the three, and he's won. 
Um, I mean, Giuseppe Cassioli was last in that race after racing up with the pace around the inside. He's won next time out. Um, so it's not impossible that Lawn Ranger and Sweet Reward, 7-1 to one and 8-1, to one, the prices I'm looking at, can finish 1-2 here. So, uh, you know, rather than have you two quid on a lottery ticket, have a pound each way, uh, sorry, a pound reverse forecast on that pair. Very good. And that is in the 410 at Goodwood as well. And two good prices about those um, two runners as well in Lawn Ranger and Sweet Reward. So perfect. We will move on to Beverly then. That sums up our action at Goodwood. So we'll move on to Beverly and we'll start with the opening contest. This is the 205, the Silver Cup handicap, a 0 to 105 handicap for three year olds over a mile two. Now, in terms of the trends for this race that we've seen in recent years, ideally you want to be working around a 90 mark, five pound either side of it. Um, low draws have been favoured in the last few years, but only seven runners here. So whether or not that's going to factor in. Generally, this race has gone to a horse we know a bit about. More of an exposed runner with experience rather than an unexposed type. But it did go to Illarab last year and just his fourth career start and obviously kick-started the rest of his brilliant season. Pace held up as well last year. Favourites don't have a fantastic record in this race. So for that reason, I'd probably give a chance to the outsider of the party at the time of recording, at least anyway. And that's uh, horse number two, Mr. Excellency. Rated 87, so in the right ballpark for this contest. Low draw in two, which he should be able to put to good use, I thought, with front-running tactics. And if last year's race is anything to go by, hopefully those tactics will hold up. As long as he doesn't go as hard as he did last time out uh, in Goodwood's mm -hmm. Class 2 handicap. But he has got the eight starts to his name, so he is experienced as well. So I will leave it to you both. So, Daryl, starting with you, how do you assess this race? Um, I haven't really in much depth because I thought it was a load of old rubbish. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> but um, I thought Barnow was the right the right market leader. Here. Um, cheap mm -hmm. pieces first time are interesting. I didn't think he ran too badly at Ripon last time over over a mile and a half. I thought drop back and trip would be um, definitely would definitely suit him. I thought he just emptied out a little bit in the closing stages there. Back on a quicker surface here. I thought there was absolutely no issues. I thought. I thought his main market rivals, in terms of March Law and, and Titan, were both returning from uh, from long layoffs. Mm. I thought he'd have a fitness edge over his over those. No recollections, interesting, but he, I'm starting to question his attitude. Um, and Mr. <laughs> Excellency, you, you do make a, a nice case for Mr. Excellency, Excellency out on the outside of the field there. But I thought Barnow was due to get his head in front, and um, the handicap has given him a chance, leaving him on the same mark, despite running really well the last twice. Uh, trip ground. First time cheap pieces could just bring a little bit more out on him. Very, very convincing case made for Barnow there. Andrew, have you got an equally compelling case for one? Yeah, it's, it's tricky at Beverly at the moment because we, we're used to low drawn prominent races when the ground's like this. We've had a few meetings this year where they've overwatered on the inner and mm -hmm. everything's coming late and wide down the middle of the track. Uh, the last two day meeting at Beverly was a bit like that. So it's kind of ideally you want to let a race or two go and, and see how the track's riding. Um, Mr. Excellency, the one you made a great case for is um, one of please, one of, please, positive. One, one of four on my yeah, one of four on my shortlist. Trouble is, you've got another Mark Johnson runner, March Law, yeah. um, who's been off the track for over four hundred days, nibbled at uh, I think nines into thirteen to two um, with the firm who opened the betting, drawn in store one. You know, Mark Johnson says he doesn't tell his jockeys how to ride; he just lets them get on with it. So. Sometimes you find them taking each other on, you know, will, you know, Ben Curtis take a lead from Mr. Excellency and Connor Beasley or will it be the other way around? So a bit of guesswork involved with that. Uh, Barnell uh, is a qualifier on a Roger Charlton first time cheek pieces system. That's a profitable angle. So I thought he'd go well, like Daryl says, the rightful favourite. And, and you've got to respect the money for Farhan. Um, the, the betting opened at 10s. Mm. Within a breath, Farhan was 11 to 2 for the John Butler yard. You know, what happened to 9 to 1, 8 to 1, 7 to 1 to 6 to 1, all those prices in between? <laughs> that were just going straight from 10s into 11 to 2. Um, the, the stable landed a big gamble at Chelmsford on Thursday with Power On, who I think was 25s at one stage into 13 to 2. And he's, he's been running really well, you know, only beating the neck last time out, uh, beating a short head by um, no recollection a few runs ago at Salisbury. So I'll side with Barn Owl on the, uh, on the cheap pieces, Roger Charlton angle, but it's a bit of a minefield. And mm. it's, yeah, I'd be, I'd be happy just to get through the place spot in this race, I think. Yes, definitely so. I feel a bit ganged up on in this race now. The pair of you have joined forces, <laughs> which is always an intimidating <laughs> angle to be to be siding against in this race, and especially with an outsider. So we'll see how that goes. But as you say, a very tricky race to assess. So hopefully 
The 315 will be a much easier contest to try and assess. The Beverly Bullet Sprint Stakes, a listed contest for three-year-olds and over, over five furlongs. And I have to confess, I absolutely love this race. And yet again, it features one of my favourite rivalries in racing, the battle between Judicial and Dakota Gold. Who needs the New York Yankees versus the Boston Red Sox? <laughs> Who needs Arsenal versus Spurs? City versus United? All you need in for a sporting rivalry is Judicial versus Dakota Gold. <laughs> <laughs> and this pair already vying for favouritism as well. Uh, so the battles have already started. Of course, these two have won the last two runnings of this race as well. So I do think it will go to one of these lovable pair here. I have absolutely no idea how to split them. They both had very similar draws to when they won their respective races as well. So I will let you both make my mind up for me of who to side with or, or if it's another runner in this contest. So Andrew, I will start with you. How do I split them? Yeah, I, I, flipping hard to. I almost said something <laughs> else there. But, uh, yeah, I mean, this is this is a cracking, cracking uh, renewal. I mean, uh, we, we haven't had a uh, three-year-old winner since 2010, but over the last 15 years you would have made a profit back in them blind to £12.50 I mean the draw has been very important in this race with low numbers favoured um, in the last 10 years since the draw was reversed in 2011 um, still six or higher just two from 59 and uh, so you know be looking at stalls one to five if you want to narrow the field. And front runners got a really good record as well. In, in the last 10 years, five of the 10 winners were uh, made, made all the running. Mm. And it's one of those races, even when you look at it pre-race, you think, well, there's a few who can go forward here. If something else pings out from a low draw. Um, so if we're dealing with that kind of Beverly and they haven't overwatered the rail, then uh, that's certainly an angle. And you know, judicial would certainly qualify on that front. I mean, I, I love Dakota Gold. He tends to peak in the second half of the season. He was drawn out of it in the end at uh, York. That was in the Nunthorpe. And he could be drawn out of it again in here. So still 10 would put me off. Hurricane Ivor, I think, has been really unlucky this season. You know, since that dead heat Sandown win, when he'd actually clearly won and the photo finish equipment was 40. He's then gone to Ascot. He's poorly drawn behind significantly. He's only just got chinned. Six furlongs on soft ground uh, was too much for him at Goodwood. He's finished in mid-division in the um, Stewards Cup. And then last week at York, behind uh, the brilliant Copper Knight, He's done best of those to come from off the pace, finishing third. Typical York sprint, the pace held up. So I, I think, you know, fast forward in a year's time, Hurricane Ivor will be the, the most progressive one of these and mm. will have um, gone on to group um, success, I, I think. But for the ter for the, you know, in terms of this, I'm tempted to go with just another bottle, a front runner from store one, improved for the first time blinkers when winning the great St. Wilfred, arguably flattered from the high draw that day. But I thought there was, he, he still won with a ton in hand and... Um, you know, maybe he, if that rail is favoured, he can uh, see them all off and he's 14 to 1. But it's a, it's a really tricky race and it's hard to dismiss many of them. It is. And I found it really tricky to know exactly which way the pace was going to go in this. And if Dakota Gold is going to be able to get to the front himself from Saw 10, as you say, I think it's going to be very difficult for any horse to get to the front in, in front of just another bottle there from Saw 2. But Daryl, you may have another angle from a pace perspective and a selection perspective in this race. I, 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 to be honest, I thought there was quite a, quite a bit of pace on in this race. I thought looks like significantly would be prominent in Marvellous, uh, Dakota Gold. Um, Andrew's absolutely just bombed my selection out of all of his stats. <laughs> but, uh, uh, it was actually James Tate's wise words. I think this is one of the most unluckiest horses uh, mm. of the season, to be honest. Um, you go back to Doncaster last year in the Scarborough Stakes. This horse finished on the bridle behind Tarbouche, who's, uh, who just loves... Doncaster, uh, Urban Beat and, D and Dakota Gold just got no run whatsoever. She's improving at a rate of knots. Uh, I think the Newbury run came too quickly for her next time behind Lazuli. Then she's bumped into uh, Declaring Love, just touched off uh, by her head, but she was again, not best positioned in that race. Uh, air and listed race down a penultimate start. She should have won, but um, should have been keep busy. But uh, again, no run, it, no luck in running. Um, I'm sure she's going to go in sooner or later. And I just thought that this race had plenty of stacks of pace on. I thought that she could be coming, um, tanking there on the bridle, and hopefully she can pick up. But like Andrew said, this if this turns into one of those races where they just don't get caught and they just continue to make the run in, she's going to have no chance. But she's a double-figure price. I, I, there's more to come from her, and that form from the Scarborough Stakes doesn't leave her too much to find with those at the top of the market. So I thought Wise Words was well worth taking an each-way chance on. 
Um, I just want to give a mention to uh, our, our friend Ostilio, uh, who's, mm. who's a fifty to one mm. shot in here. Uh, put him up for the uh, for the stewards' cup. He ran no sort of race for the wrong side of the track and soft ground. Um, but last time at York, it really was an eye catching effort. Now I'm not entirely sure why on earth Luke Morris come from the centre of the track to switch over to the stand side where it was unfavoured all week, but he did, um, and he picked up really strongly and ran on um, in eye catching fashion towards the uh, towards the end of the race. I actually don't think Ostido is probably a five furlong horse. I think six furlongs uh, is probably his trip. That's why I put him up for the uh, for the Stewards Cup. But if this has a pace collapse in it. I can see Ostilio running really, really well. He's 50 to 1 in there. I think he's got... I can't not have a couple of quid on him. I think he's going to go in sooner or later. And if it's not here, I'd like to see him dropped into a handicap, um, into a in class next time, into mm-hmm. a handicap. And, uh, yeah, he, he, he's, uh, he might take you off a cliff, Ostilio, but um, <laughs> he, he's interested in a 50 to 1. But wise words will be the selection for the purposes of this video. Yeah, so for this video, wise words, but hopefully a few savers on Osilio in case today's a day, but ideally in grade, d- down in grade. Down in grade in a handicap. Time out. Yeah, yeah, ideally. Definitely one for the trackers, at least anyway. And the cliff horses, don't worry, Daryl. I must <laughs> falling off the page at the minute with cliff horses so yeah we all have them and we're all very proud of them and we'll all not be on them the day that they come good so in terms of uh, further beverly selections now daryl i'll throw it to you again here in case you do have any other selections at beverly in any of our other contests uh no <laughs> I'm, not mass- I'm not a massive fan of the track i've got a couple from windsor later on and, and um uh, new market as well, but uh, nothing at Beverly. It's not one of my favourite tracks. I think Andrew does exceptionally well here, but <laughs> would be my uh, greatest stroke rate at Beverly. <laughs> I promise I'm not trying to stitch you up with these. Yes, extras. you are. <laughs> <laughs> I'll come to you for for the any extras at New Market next. I promise, Andrew yourself. Any other selections at Beverly? Not a thing. Wonderful. What? Talking talking of Andrew's track. There you go. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Perfect. We will move swiftly on then to new markets and we'll move on to the July course. And our sole race that we're going to focus on in detail, at least anyway for now, is the 245, the listed hopeful stakes for three year olds and older over six furlongs. Now, I thought this race looked a wide open contest, really. Certainly, I thought an opportunity to take on Tab Deed at the head of a market with Plenty of lurkers at this listed level. And the one who I thought looked very interesting was Royal Scimitar. I hope he is going to be the lurker I talk about. He remains very unexposed as a sprinter. And talk about a race that got away uh, from us last time out Don't. at Ascot <laughs> in the Sherlock. <laughs> I, 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 I went for a touch. I went for a touch I, have I touched a nerve? Have I touched a nerve in this? Yeah, yeah when, when, um, when he was alone towards the near side, oh. I thought, he's not out of this. And I kept throwing a few quid at him in running and he, he would have got me a fortune in the end. And uh, uh, yeah, needless to say, just run, just run out of it. So, yeah. And he still nearly won. And I despite everything. Well, despite I everything. Oh, I know. Yeah. And, and the winner went and won the Grey Horse Handicap next time out as well. So that just oh, rubbed good, salt then. into the wound. Oh, yeah. So hopefully he has the race to run to suit him here. And I just think I thought he was a good thing for a handicap again next time out. So it is interesting that they're citing him in a listed contest. So hopefully that's a positive sign for him anyway. But um, yeah, that was definitely one that got away, apparently for everyone, at least anyway. So, Andrew, is he going to be your selection or are you looking elsewhere? Yeah, he is. Uh, I tipped him in my Racing and Football Outlook column on Monday. He he was a horse I put up as a bet each way at 40 to 1 in that hot July festival uh, course and distance handicap a few runs back. And he's he's out on the wrong side of the track, as it turns out. He's finished fourth of 17. He's won the race on his side. The next home on that flank, when the dealing's done, of course, won at Goodwood next time, albeit dropped his uh, to five furlongs. Uh, and bizarrely, that was his first six furlong run since winning at Newbury on his debut. And it's quite rare for Clive Cox horses to um, win f- um, first time out at Newbury, his local track. He often runs his best ones there, like Cody Bear, but they, they often get beaten near the experience. And I think at one stage, he was something like one from 93 with first time out horses at Newbury. Um, so that, you know, Royal Scimitar was then tried over seven furlongs and a mile, often running well, but, you know, not um, uh, you know, not brilliantly. Dropped back to, to six in that new market handicap, ran at Belter, and then um, is it pulled out because of the soft ground in the in the Stewards' Cup. Uh, mm. um, thank goodness he was, because he was drawn on the wrong side, as it turned out. And then last time, as you say, uh, raced alone at um, Ascot, 
narrowly beaten. Another solid effort, and he is open to improvement as a sprinter. Yeah, there should be plenty of pace on here. You've got Kudam in first-time blinkers, and um, you know, Tab Deeds tends to be prominent. And you know, hopefully, Extraordinaire, of course, has been running really well here in handicaps. Um, it only has one way of running, so that one will lead them down the middle of the track from stall one with the stalls on the far side. Stall nine might be a little bit away from the pace, but I'm still mm. siding with Royal Scimitar here. Right, that's two votes for Royal Scimitar now. Are we going to bring up the hat trick with you, Daryl? Absolutely not. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually Wait, hoping. An operate. <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually hoping Royal Scimitar might be one of the pace angles because uh, I like Cardem drawn in stall ten. Might not be the place to be. Um, stall, stalls nine and ten, um, but. You know, we can't do much about that. Blinkers first time, I thought, were a good addition. I thought it'd spark him up a little bit. I thought seven furlongs, good soft ground at Chester last time, was absolutely a terrible decision by Charles Hills. <laughs> no, I, I, he got sweaty beforehand. He got very warm. I thought he did well, considering he was posted wide for much of the race. Just not, It's just not him. He's a sprinter. Good to firm ground. Fast ground, he's a sprinter. Um, he was not too bad at New... Uh, Newcastle, he got no run down the centre of the track, had to switch out into the centre of the track and um, stayed on quite nicely. He's only beaten half a length by Tab D. Mm. I cannot believe Tab D is as short as two to one for this and it's six to one bar. I think it's ridiculous. Yeah. Um, the time before that at Salisbury, I felt like it's a race that was laid on a plate for him, but I'm not entirely sure if there was something slightly amiss because he tra- tanked through the race but look, by far the best horse. When he went to pick up, he hung straight away to his right and I thought there might have been something slightly amiss there with him. Um, but he returns to Newmarket for the first time since finishing fourth in the July Cup. He's only beaten three lengths by Oxford. Stayed on really strongly. He likes it in this course. He's won here before. Um, and if the blinkers do help him out, concentrate when quick and up in the, inside the final two furlongs, he'll be very hard to beat here. Uh, mm-hmm. I don't, like I say, I don't think he's got much to, beat, to find with Tab D. Raw Crusades out for him. Some again caught the eye a little bit in the Stewards Cup last time, but um, he's not really running up to the level he was last year. I he thought was Rourke second Sim- in the race last year, I think, some again, wasn't he? Um, yeah, he was. Yeah, and he did catch the odds off ground at Goodwood last time, staying on, you know, when denied a clear run in that Stewards Cup. But um, I, I, I do think there's more to come from Cardem. Um, it's very difficult to get that Goodwood Stewards Cup win out of the mind when he won off uh, Mark 107 very, very easily. He's not gone the right way so far this season, but the blinkers could just spark him back into life. And I don't think he's had the conditions in his favour um, to improve as such yet. Um, so, yeah, card in for me. I don't think this is a strong race. Mm. No, I was going to say, and that's why it surprised me more and more so that Tabdeed is the current price that he is. So, yeah, I think we're all at least in agreement on that part, that he's he's a favourite to take on, at least in this race. So that's a positive there. Um, very strong selections against the favourites for this race, which is very interesting. Now, that is our, well, our stun for Newmarket, at least anyway. So, as I said, I'll throw it up to the floor for any other selections at Newmarket. Daryl, I promise I'd side with you first. So we'll go to Andrew first for any selections <laughs> at Newmarket uh, no nothing for me uh, but, uh, I feel like I put the mockers on whoever I go to first there's, there's no selections there so no Daryl apologies yeah. we will go back to you for another selection my chair's going again yeah just uh, just, uh, just the one I'm <laughs> just I'm going to have to get a new, I don't know if I've got to get a new chair or I've just put on so much weight that it just keeps <laughs> it just keeps dropping down uh, either, either way, something's got to change. Uh, yeah, the 5 5 new market. I like Cambridgeshire. It's a horse that um, dummy for a good bit of cash last time at Nottingham. Um, looked, out of the, looked out of the race and stayed on really strongly. This horse is almost certainly better than a mark of 70. Um, I like the booking of Andrea at senior on board for Martin Mead this time, back at Newmarket, where she was such a big eye catcher behind um, Passion Over, who I think is a, a decent horse. Uh, that race has worked out quite well. I, a mark of 70 should really... Um, not be beyond Cambridgeshire. So second mm-hmm. start and handicap, I think uh, another step forward is is going to be taken now stepped up and trip. So, yeah. Lovely job. So that is Cambridgeshire, horse number eight in the 505 at Newmarket. And you know what that sinking feeling is, Daryl, of why, why you're falling down? It's the weight of carrying this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, do that, Andrew. Now, uh, moving swiftly on, I will again open up the floor to any other selections from anywhere else. I know we had a bit of a wild card from you last week, Andrew, at Kalani. So we'll, uh, it could, we could go anywhere. <laughs> this week so Andrew I'll, I'll pass it over to you any other selections from anywhere else well I did have a good look at Navin but I thought no I'll, uh, <laughs> I'll, 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 stay, I'll, I'll, say, I'll stay domestic this time I'm going to go with the 610 at uh, Red Car the straight mile qualifier with uh, Ulshaw Bridge 
Um, he was a big eye catcher at um, uh, Carlisle on his penultimate start when it was the it was the uh, Cumberland Plate um, over sorry the Carlisle Belt, and he's um, he's done best of those to come from off the pace in a race where the um, you know the, the front runners never came back. The winner, the second, the third, the fifth were all on the front end throughout. He's done best of the uh, best of the closes in fourth. Um, he's then run it uh, over course and distance next time. And I've looked at putting him up as a bet. I thought, well, there's no pace in the race. And, you know, he's, he's going to be a hostage to fortune again, probably race freely, get going all too late. What's happened? He's drifted to 14 to 1. PJ McDonald's has decided he's going to change tactics and make all of them. And he's mm-hmm. duly won. So uh, without me having a penny on. So, uh, yeah, maybe a repeat of that. Offshore Bridge, around about 8 to 1, I think, uh, which seems yep. fair value in a small field in that 6 10 at red car. Yeah, that is Osho Bridge number six in the six ten at Redcar. Very good, Daryl. From yourself, any other selections? Uh, just one, Kate. Windsor in the six o'clock. Um, I cannot believe Tiona is a nine to four favourite for this race. My goodness, <laughs> what has she beaten? People are still nine-four? hanging on. They're still hanging. Oh, on. <laughs> madness! Mad if you're backing that at nine to four. Uh, Fox Tower seven to one in the race. Caught the eye. Goodwood last time behind Passion and Glory. Um, just had no sort of run. That that form line sort of sets the stand in this race. Desert Encounter does like it here. But Foxtail is uh, a horse that's promised plenty, but has done a lot wrong. Um, mm-hmm. But I think he is uh, about to strike a little bit of form. So, yeah, style of Foxtail at 7-1, to one, I think, uh, at the 6 o'clock at Windsor. Yeah, as you say, about that price at current time of recording, 7-1, to one, really nice price about horse number four, Foxtail, in the 6 o'clock at Windsor. That just leaves naps to cover now. So, Andrew, I'll, I'll pass it back to you. Obviously, it's a tricky weekend in terms of having a very strong selection, I thought. But uh, your nap for the weekend, please. Yeah, you're spot on there. I, I was th- looking at Lawn Ranger. I was looking at Royal Scimitar. Um, but I'm going to side with Ulshaw Bridge in the 6-10 at Redcar. Very good. Just covered that race then. And Arrow, yourself, your nap, please. Yeah, I agree with you. that It's, it's one of those weekends, probably you've not got an overly strong fancy. You're probably going to need a slight bit of luck. Uh, so I'm going to side with Cardem in the 245 mm. uh, Newmarket. Very good. And I am going to go into the feature race of the day. Uh, it is a very tricky ra- day to assess, but I did think you're getting enough value still about Ben Battle in the 335 the Celebration Mile in the hope that he can basically just give his running and he'll be fit enough to do so. So there are your three naps for the weekend. Plenty of fancies for you as well. That's us all wrapped up in terms of the racing anyway. If you need any more information, you can find all you need on the website at gg.co.uk or on the lads' social media channels. Their Twitter handles are at Daryl Carter 7 or at Trend Horses for Andrew or at gg.co.uk for GG's Twitter page. There are all of the race cards and stats for you to get your teeth stuck into on the website. Yona will be back with you next week. But thank you so much for entertaining me, having me host this week's show. It's been an awful lot of fun. I have a whole plethora of horses I need to go off and back <laughs> now. So hopefully we found you some winners. Thank you so much for watching and we'll catch up with you again soon. Bye.